Okay, welcome back. We're here live in Silicon Valley, heart of Silicon Valley. It's the San Jose Convention Center. This is siliconangle.com and wikibon.org's exclusive coverage of Hadoop Summit 2013. And we're wrapping up day two of two days of amazing technology, innovation, developers, companies, entrepreneurs, building an industry all around big data and Hadoop, Hadoop Summit. This is where the action is. This is theCUBE, this is our flagship program where we go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise, and we want to talk to the best and brightest, and we have that here today. Uh, our, our good friend who is uh, in, in the architectures that matter, and we're going to hear about that today. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE, and I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of wikibon.org. Constantine Budnik is here, and he is the director of engineering, big data for WAN Disco, uh, super alpha geek, uh, working on big top, uh, Apache Hadoop committer, uh, you know Dr. Oz, we call him Dr. Kaz. Welcome to theCUBE. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, it's a real pleasure actually to be on the show. I, I'm a big fan of yours and uh, um, I've been following actually uh, Silicon Angle since pretty much day two when you guys sit in, in, the, in the same office as, as I did uh, across the floor and it was actually amazing to see how this, this whole, you know, number one media coverage in technology today company came, came across, so it, it, it's actually, it's an honor. Well, we well, thank you, we're really proud of that, and, uh, and, and it's people like you, uh, Constantine, that have really helped educate us on markets and, and point us in the right direction, you know, following, I, I called you an alpha geek, I hope you, you know, accept that as a compliment, <laughs> and, uh, but seriously, you know, John Furry in particular uh, has a nose for looking, watching guys like you, and marking those trends, and that's what theCUBE's try to do, is try to yeah. lead that. And highlight, Dave, the tech athletes, right? So yep. to us, you know, we love theCUBE because it allows us to have a conversation, you know that, and, but more importantly, more than ever, the social media, the social web is about people, and we believe that to be true, and ultimately, the tech athletes are the guys who are sprinting the marathons, it's entrepreneurs, it's guys building the technology, that's what this Hadoop Summit's about. Constantine, you know, we were talking about that the other night, and I really appreciate the comments, and we'll use that number one, and we'll put a, a press release out tomorrow. We're number one <laughs> in technology <laughs> coverage as, uh, as, as, as you can but, you're, the you're the source, you're the, you're the market <laughs> research. Uh, but in all, in all seriousness, when Disco, you guys are at the center of the conversation here at Hadoop Summit around uh, your technology. You guys are doing some things that are pretty compelling, a little bit, different, but yet getting the attention. Please explain to the folks here um, what you guys are doing and why is it attracting so much attention? Yeah, everybody talking about it, you know, making Hadoop enterprise ready, enterprise great, I and mean, this is what you guys do, right? Yes, essentially, yes. So one of our key, I would say the most key technology that we bring into the Hadoop space is the uh, solution for single point of failure in HDFS. Uh, it's a big problem for, for any system, but it's specifically for the system that can handle the tens and, and literally hundred petabytes of the information on, on your enterprise uh, infrastructure. Uh, if the file system of the size goes down and becomes unavailable, it's actually a big problem because essentially everything around it becomes frozen, right? So you cannot run your analytics job, you cannot run, run your map reduces, you cannot run your hives, it's, it's done, your data is unavailable. So what we're trying to do, and we actually what we did, is uh, using one of the um, quite old technologies called uh, Paxos algorithm, distributed um, distributed coordination or distributed uh, distributed coordination approach actually, you know, uh, to 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 bring multiple name nodes to single Hadoop, uh, Hadoop file system. So basically, the the traditional high availability architecture in HDFS allows you to have a main master and it's what was called uh, a standby node where all the, the journal uh, transactions are being written in case something bad happened to the master. So then you can copy over the edit logs and try to spawn the, the, the new name node. So, but it, it usually comes with a downtime. So it could be five minutes, it could be half an hour, it could be half, one and a half minute, sometime, anyway. So, and if you absolutely cannot afford uh, nine, five nines availability and you absolutely have to have 100% availability, the traditional HA is not an answer for you because you're going to be losing time. So the only the only game in town essentially who can help you is uh, Vandisky system, where we guarantee 100% uptime of the Hadoop, literally 100%. That's and a pretty that's a pretty bold claim. So let's break that down. You're talking 100% uptime. That's obviously the talk of the show. I just put a tweet out there. How do you guys do that? I mean, that's a really bold claim. Yeah. So this is the bold claim, and and of course we cannot guarantee that your power would be 100% up, right? I mean, we, we, we do not deliver magic. 
we cannot guarantee that your switch actually would not blow up in Iraq, right? We, we cannot control that. But when it comes to availability of the name nodes and availability of the metadata in HDFS, we guarantee that we run the multiple, multiple masters. Every single client of yours can work with either of the masters. And if one of the masters dies for whatever reason, the rest of them actually keep going. So until you have the majority of name nodes around, you are totally fine. So if you have three of them, you can kill one. If you have seven of them, you can kill up to up to three, and so on and so forth. And it actually depends on your use case, how many name nodes you want to and, have and, around. And as we talked about the other night, you don't do this using like bit slicing and... and, and no, no, no. You basically, if I understand it right, in Hadoop, the metadata is separated from the data. Yeah. Now what typically happens is at distance, you would copy that metadata and you're paying the typical asynchronous RPO penalty, the, the amount of data that you might lose uh, exactly. If in fact that you know that, that that right has not occurred at the remote location, you you got it and you got it completely right. So basically, our approach is share nothing. So our name nodes do not share the storage. Our name nodes, every single name node has its own copy of the of the uh, metadata, and we essentially our approach is very simple, right? Instead of dealing with the issues once they happen, we actually guarantee that the issues do not happen, right? So if you try to create the file, the name nodes come to the consensus first before the file is created. And once the consensus is reached, the, the information about the, the state of the file system across all the name nodes becomes actually the same. So, and every one of them keeps their copy separately. So this is why when one name node dies, others literally don't care. So I kind of I kind of foresee your next question, right? So you can say, okay, what what if the the <laughs> he'd be a cube yeah. uh, commentator too? Just give him the mic. Why even be a guest? <laughs> Why don't you be a host? <laughs> you keep are, you, are you making me an offer? <laughs> 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 now you're making more money where you're at. Now stay where you are, doctor. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, you you might say, okay, so if the dead name node actually came back to life, essentially, right? Won't it try to steal the clients and tell them the wrong, give them the wrong information? Right. So essentially, the split brain problem, right? So actually, no, we don't have split brain problem because once your uh, offline name node came back, it wouldn't become active and would not be serving clients until actually it reconciled with the majority of the name nodes that the information it has actually has. Until that knowledge propagates. So use the pa exactly. uh, Paxos algorithm, which has been around for you know, a long time. 30, you know, 30 years. You know, 30 years, I was going to say that. 20 plus, but okay. So the so original so Lumpur. Right, so it's very you know, well understood. And you, you use this concept of, uh, of eventual knowledge. Uh, right. right, and then, but the application sees one copy of that metadata, mm -hmm. right? And so that is unique uh, exactly. in, in the marketplace. Now, we talked the other night about you know other examples of this. I threw out Google Spanner, you know, as right. you know a, a technique to have kind of globally distributed, you know, coherent right. data. Right. Um, but but share with us what you sh what you told me in terms of the differences. Well, so the, the the first and foremost difference that most most of the people would probably care about is that. Well, how many companies like Google are there in the world, right? Okay, here we go. So how many companies One. can, yeah, <laughs> okay. How many companies can allow actually to build essentially Spanner, right? So maybe eBay, maybe Yahoo, pretty much that's yeah, it, yeah, right? Yeah. So however, there are 500 Fortune companies, there are 1,000 Fortune companies, and maybe 30% or 50% of those companies need, need, need continuous availability, right? They, they cannot afford to hire the staff that Google has, right? So that's, that's actually the most important business case from my standpoint of view. Technology-wise, yeah. we can debate if Spanner is better or Paxos is better. It's not that, that that really matters, seriously, because we allow you to, for, for a very reasonable price, guarantee the absence of SPOF and HDFS, which has been actually haunting this, this community for quite a long time, right? So, and there, there, there are the other attempts to, 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 to solve the problem, and uh, Mapar is trying to do this, and Clouder is trying to do this important work. But as I said, they are highly available systems. They are not continuously available, and this is, this is a very important distinction. Well, and, and I mean, you know, conceptually, the way the, the data center world has solved this problem in the past is essentially by brute force. Yeah. You know, cop making copies and, and, and making maybe mirrors, mirrors, three site right. data centers, Precisely. very expensive. Right. Um, and it another problem with mirrors, actually, you cannot sometimes, well, in often cases, you cannot guarantee the, the mm -hmm. sync up between the mirrors because one thing you do in the backup 
the mirror for the backup purpose and the, the, the other thing when you're trying to actually mirror a number of the data sets and, and let people use it and let people update it. Mm -hmm. And then you face the problem how you will sync up them back, right? And that's actually essentially very hard. So talk a little bit about Big Top. Um, you're obviously heavily involved uh, in that. Share with our audience. What yeah, <laughs> Big Top is another Apache Software Foundation project. Um, I've been one of the co-founders uh, of it back at uh, when I was working at Cloudera. And uh, it has been open sourced uh, and uh, went through the incubation uh, project, uh, incubation period and become top level project recently. Essentially, Big Top is a framework that guarantees and allows you to build software stacks, not necessarily Hadoop, but software stacks with preset characteristics, which means that I want to have Hadoop of that particular version. I want to have HBase of this particular version. I want to have Pig, Hive, and, and the rest of these particular versions. And then when I got all of them, I want to build RPM packages and I want to guarantee that these bits would work together nicely. So do some sort of integration, validation, system integration testing, right? So BitTop gives you uh, ability to define the stack, build the stack, deploy the stack using Puppet, and actually test it with internal test framework and the set of the tests. So it's essentially all around solution for software stack uh, developers. Talk a little bit about, uh, you know, John mentioned tech athletes, we love, we love that term. Um, just watching the folks at Wandisco, I mean, you guys made, obviously made an acquisition, you got people like yourself that came from Cloudera. How is it that this little company, you know, the self-funded company, that obviously now a public company, was able to attract such talent? Uh, what is it about the culture of, of Wandisco that's quite unique? I think it, it might be one of those cultural things when, um, as you said, self, self, self-funded company, like yourself guys actually. What fascinates me, I, I tried to, to run, to start actually four companies in my life. All of them were started on a self-funded money. None of them actually went through. So I know how hard is that. So I have actually deep, deep respect to the guys like you and, and to the guys like David Richards, who were able to find the right mix of the innovation development and the sales techniques to literally start selling products since like week three, right? So uh, that one of the aspects actually that have my very deep, deep respect. Uh, the second aspect, I think, I believe, and again, I've been, I've been in the software business for about 20 years. I, I, I hold 14 US patents on distributed technologies. I think what these guys doing is the most bleeding edge of the uh, continuous availability in distributed systems. Seriously, I mean, so it's, it's not a self-plug. That but excites you right there. That's yeah. what I'm, trying, I'm very I mean, excited. You, yeah. You know, you, I'm very excited. You, and of you, course, you, these guys 15 minutes from my door, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's very innovative. That. That's good innovation right there. That's innovation to your lifestyle, societal yeah. benefits to you, Precise. and the gas that you don't have to spend traveling, Precise. commuting. Precise. So, so I want to ask you also about your perspective. Obviously, you have experience, got a lot of patents in, 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 in tech, so you're certainly, you, you have chops there. But open source is changing. We're now maturing as, a, as an industry, right? I remember when I first broke out of college, open source was like really post Unix and then Linux, even before Linux, as Linux was hitting the scene, you had that movement, early stage pioneers, and then now it's maturing and st standard operating procedures to use open source. What do you think needs to happen in the community? You're involved in the projects. Dave and I were saying all this summer tour with theCUBE that this, the new standards bodies are the open source communities being ratified with code actions and adoption are ultimately the proof points. The de facto standard is the ratification of these standards by the communities, no more governing bodies. <clears throat> so with that being said, what do you think open source needs to do to continue to accelerate at the same time, innovate and be constructive? Well, it's, it's a very loaded question apparently. Thanks a lot, John. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, Take it wherever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think the, the, the beauty of open source and essentially the, the power of open source is this is an evolutionary, an evolutionary development, right? So if you, if you think of how our species came around, right? And, and we, we can argue about that, right? So, but technically speaking, our species kind of came around as a series of small successes and small mistakes, okay? We never had a mistakes or errors built up to the very high fat and uh, fat tail actually distribution uh, problem, right? So open source goes exactly this way. Open source is trying to do a lot of small steps and some of them are faulty, some of them are successful, but the overall move is very positive and always forward. 
Okay, so that that's what fascinates me about the open source. What needs to happen in open source in terms of being more acceptable, more successful? Well, I mean, only only probably few people actually do an open source day to day uh, just because they love open source. I mean, the open source is essentially, in my opinion, is financed by by the companies who are actually trying to build the products around open source, right? Sure. Like Red Hat, right? It's a good example. SUSE, Intel. Vandiska. Vandiska is a good example, actually, because these guys were doing open source project in form of uh, subversion, actually, pretty much since day one, right? So they, 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 they know very well what open source means. Apache Track project has been actually funded uh, by, by, by large, by, by Vandiska. And uh, now we try and we actually committed to be 100% open source, except for this little library, you know, the, the Paxos implementation that, that we actually keep proprietary. But everything else, everything else is 100% open source. Uh, I'm proud to say that our distribution is actually based on 100% 205 Hadoop, which has been released actually about a month ago. Uh, all other components are actually 100% uh, releases from, from the Apache open source. So we actually don't do any tricky modifications and stuff. So I think what, what, need, what needs to be done in order to success, the open source needs to get more and more companies, commercial bodies, who would come and start contributing in, into, the, into the movement to help it grow, essentially. Well, Constantine, it's been a great show for you guys. When just yeah. going to give a congratulations out to you guys. Um, Thank you. One, uh, we've been following you for a while. Certainly the technology's solid, but you guys really broke above the noise this week by having the most excellent product out there, 100% uptime, great message. Obviously ratified, uh, ratified by a lot of the success you hit at the show. Congratulations and really enjoyed seeing you and your team. Uh, thanks, for thanks for coming on theCUBE. Stay tuned guys, because we have a great in-memory technology is actually coming on Hadoop from Berkeley Amp Labs. So another open source project. Stay tuned. Awesome. We'll great, be great, thanks thanks great, great Thank citizenship you on you guys and great stuff. This is theCUBE, this is the flagship program. We've got the advanced distracted signal from those. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with the Horton work guys to get a summary of what happened this past two days and get their take on what was, what was expected, what wasn't expected, and find out really what happened here outside the cube and of course in the lounge areas. We'll be right back with that right after the short break. Then Dave and I will wrap up the show and put a, a bow on these two days. This is SiliconANGLE, we'll keep on the cube, we'll be right back. <laughs>